if you open your Bible to Ephesians, find chapter 2 and verse 6. And the reason I say we're going to jump right into the middle is because verse 6 begins with the word and, which means we're carrying the thought on from the first five verses. But we will, we will go back to them briefly in the sermon, but mainly our attention will be from verses 6 to verse 10 today. If you didn't bring a copy of God's Word with you, and you haven't already discovered there's a Bible in the pew rack in front of you, and if you'll take that Bible out and find page 976, you'll find Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6. That's 976. And if you don't have a copy of God's Word, I would, I would want you to find that Bible in the pew rack and look at the words as I, as I read them. And so let's, let's read Ephesians chapter 2, and I want to begin in verse 6. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Let's pray. Let's pray, and would you ask the Lord to speak through me today? Pray for me right now. And then pray for yourself. Ask the Lord to open your heart and mind to the truth that's here today. Ask Him not to let anything distract you from hearing what He desires for you to learn and see today. So pray for me and pray for yourself. I'll do the same. Father, we thank you today for the opportunity to declare your word and to listen to it and to be under the sound of it. May your Holy Spirit speak, Father. But that's the only person we want to hear today, Father. May I just become a vessel and an instrument. May his, his words, your words, be spoken through me today, Father. And may, may we all have spiritual ears to hear the truth, the essential truth of salvation, And then beyond salvation, your perfect will for our lives in every regard. So, Father, thank you in advance for what you're going to teach us and what you'll say to each person here today. We'll give you the glory for all that you're about to do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Jeopardy is a classic game show with a twist. And you know the twist. In Jeopardy, you get the answer. In Jeopardy, the answers are given first. And if you're a contestant, then you have to supply the question. It debuted on NBC in March of 1964. It is now in syndication. So let's play Jeopardy this morning. I'll give you the answers, and you come up with the questions. So here's the first answer. Grandma and the Thanksgiving turkey. Dun, 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 Grandma and the Thanksgiving turkey. And the answer is, who are two tough old birds? Okay, here's 
the next answer? 10 and 3. 10 and 3. No, that is not the Cowboys record. (laughs) The answer to that is, though, what will the Mount Vernon Tigers record be after they beat Atlanta on Friday night? Here's the next one. Not saved by them, but for them. Exactly. The question, that's the answer. The question is, what are good works? Look at these verses that I read a moment ago. We always head right to verses 8, 9, and 10, don't we? Because those are familiar verses to us. Those are verses many of you have memorized. Those are verses many of you have known since you were 9, 10 years old. Those are verses many of you have turned to, quoted for years and years. So that's where we'll start this morning, verses 8, 9, and 10. But there's something here I don't want us to miss. And so we're going to end this morning with some marvelous diamonds of truth to take home with us. But like I said, let's, let's begin in verse 8. It's, it's good for us to begin in verse 8 because there are no more important doctrinal truths found anywhere in this letter. I believe these are the most important verses, the most important doctrinal truths in the letter of Ephesians. They are packed with truth. Some of the most crucial statements to be found in all of Scripture concerning salvation are found right here in these three verses. This is a description of what it really means to be a Christian. So listen again. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God not as a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Listen, we are saved by grace, through faith, not by good works, but for good works. We are saved by grace through faith, not by good works, but for good works. But, but let's keep it simple this morning. The last point is this. You are saved by God's grace and for good works. That's what these verses say. They They tell us that we are Christians entirely and solely as a result of God's grace. Now, I want you to notice there's a positive statement followed by a negative statement. Salvation is stated what it is, and then salvation is stated what it is not. Positive and negative. The purpose of the negative statement is simply to reinforce the positive. So let's begin with the positive statement of what salvation is. For by grace, verse 8 says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Grace, let me remind you of the definition. Grace means unmerited favor. Grace means undeserved favor. It is an action which arises entirely from the gracious character of God. So salvation comes to us entirely from God. It comes to us in spite of ourself. It is unmerited, unearned, undeserved favor. In other words, salvation is not God's response to anything in us. 
Now, some people think it is. Some people seem to think that there is something in them that God looked at and said, I'll save him. I'll save her. Look at him. Look at her. I'll save them. No, remember, as I said a moment ago, we've kind of jumped into the middle of this discussion when we began in verse 6. But if you remember, back up in verses 1 and 2 and 3, remember that apart from Christ, you are dead. Apart from Christ, you are dominated by Satan. That's verse 2. Apart from Christ, you are doomed. You are by nature children of wrath. That's verse 3. There is nothing in you that God looked at and said, they are worthy of my grace. No. There is nothing in us God's grace comes to us unearned, undeserved. It is not God responding to something he sees in, in us. In, in verse 5, Paul, Paul introduced this. He, he slips it in there. He breaks every rule of grammar in, in the original Greek language in, by verse 5 when he says, Even when we were dead in our trespasses and sin, God made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. It's almost as if he couldn't wait to say it. It's almost as if he said, I've got to say it right now. I'm going to say it later and expand upon it. But right now, right here in the middle of this thought of being dead in our trespasses and sins and how God made us alive together with him and raised us up with him as verse 6 says in the middle of that he slips in this marvelous phrase and by grace you have been saved and then 8 verse 8 verse 9 he is expanding upon it. He is explaining it. Salvation, again, is not God responding to something in us. Grace excludes that. It's not something we deserve. Salvation is not something we merit. God, out of his own amazing grace and marvelous, wondrous mercy, has granted us salvation so let me help you understand what grace is all about something you can just hang your thoughts on and always remember take the letters of the word grace and remember this sentence God's riches at Christ's expense you see the first letter of every word in that sentence spells out the word grace God's riches that's eternal life that's the blessings of God that's the diamonds that we've looked at beginning with chapter 1 and verse 1 God's riches at Christ's expense you see while salvation is free to us while salvation is unmerited and undeserved on our part, while salvation doesn't cost us anything, it came at a tremendous price. The cost being the death of Jesus on the cross. The price being Jesus having to die and, and shed his blood for your sin. Jesus having to die and by his body being sacrificed and his blood being shed, you were forgiven of your sin. For by grace you have been saved, verse 8 says, through faith. What is faith? It's belief. It's belief in what I just talked about. That Christ's death on the cross was for your sin. You believe Christ's death on the cross, pepper. That's, he, he died for me. He died for you. For by grace are you saved through faith, through a belief. Faith is just the channel, though, through which this salvation comes. Faith is, is the channel through which the grace of God flows to you. You are saved by grace 
through faith. It is the medium. It is, it is, faith is the medium through which the grace of God bringing salvation enters your life. One, one man describes it this way. Faith is the hand that receives the gift of salvation. And this is not of your own doing. Now, let me, let, me, let me tell you something that if you don't quite grasp, it's okay. You'll get it one day. I, I honestly believe you will. The, the word this in the Greek is a, is a pronoun. What does it refer to? And this is not of your own doing. So you look backwards in the sentence to see what it refers to. Does it refer to grace or does it refer to saved or does it refer to faith? For by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not of your own doing. I, I believe, I believe it means both the salvation it's not of your own doing everybody gets that everybody understands that but grammatically it also refers to the faith the fact that you look at the cross of Jesus Christ and say he died you see everybody says that history can prove that it's no big deal to believe Jesus died on a cross. The fact that you can look at the cross and say, Jesus died for me is faith. It's belief. And that also is a gift from God. The ability to believe is a gift. So let me help you understand what faith is all about. Take the letters of the word faith and remember this sentence. Forsaking all, I trust him. And again, the first letter of every word in that sentence spells faith. Forsaking all, that means my own efforts, my own good deeds, my attempt to earn salvation... Forsaking all, I trust him. I believe in him. I look to Jesus on Calvary's cross and what he did there as payment for my sin. Forsaking all, I trust him. Now, let me expand upon the words forsaking all because that idea is found in the negative statement that follows Verse 8, the negative statement that I talked about earlier simply reinforces the positive statement. Look, look, it actually begins in the latter part of verse 8, and I touched on it, and then verse 9. And this is not of your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. Let me ask you a question, and I want you to think about it because you immediately are going to think it's a real easy question, but I want you to think about it. How did you become a Christian? How did you become a Christian? Do you think in any way you deserved some credit for it? Just, just maybe a, a little bit of credit. If, if you believe so, even if you just said, well, you know, I, I, a little bit of it was my part. If you believe that, it leads to boasting. And it is not biblical salvation. These words are written by a man who once was very boastful. In fact, let me just take you over for a couple of pages and you can turn if you want to or just write it down in the margin of your Bible. Just over a couple of pages to Philippians chapter 3 and let me just read you what a boastful man wrote about his life. It's the same man that wrote the book of Ephesians. It's the apostle Paul. And in Philippians chapter 3, beginning in verse 4, Paul wrote, Although I myself might have confidence in the flesh... 
Although I myself might boast in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I far more. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, and as to righteousness that is found under the law, I was blameless. You see, he was of the right people. And amongst those group of people, he was of the right tribe. And among those tribe, he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. That means you can't go far enough up his family tree. All you would find were Hebrews. Don't find any Gentiles mixed in. He was of the strictest sect of the Hebrews. He was a Pharisee. And if you want to talk about my dedication, I persecuted those people of the way. I persecuted the believers. And I did everything the law required to be found blameless. I went to the temple. I made the sacrifices. I paid the fare. I did everything I could do. I tithed everything. I'm blameless according to the law. And yet in verses 7 and 8, Paul says, all of those things I count but rubbish, loss, that I may win Christ. Do you know what Paul is saying? Paul is saying, I, I, I was a good man. I was a moral man. I was a religious man. You look at me in my life. You look at me in my religious duty. You look at me in every way you can, and I am pleasing to God. That was his attitude, and that's boasting. He was boasting. Do you remember the story of the Pharisee, Luke? Chapter 18, Jesus tells the story of the Pharisee. And, and the Pharisee said, I fast twice a week and I give tithes of all that I possess. That Pharisee was speaking the truth. He was accurate. He did that. He fasted twice a week. He gave a tithe of all that he possessed. What he spoke was exactly accurate, but he was far from God. Oh, the devil is so subtle in his temptations. The devil is so crafty in the way that he tempts us in our pride. Any preacher knows this. It's harder to convert a good man than it is to convert a bad one. It's harder to convert a moral good man than it is someone who the world would say is evil or bad. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 21 and verse 31, speaking to the Pharisees and Sadducees, Jesus said, truly I say to you, tax collectors and prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God before you. And the same is still true today. If your hope of salvation is built one smidgen on who you are or what you have done, you are far from the kingdom of God. And the woman who has been divorced five times and is currently living with a sixth man whom she is not married to is getting into the kingdom ahead of you. The gospel makes paupers of us all. It condemns every one of us. We are saved by God's grace or not at all. We must forsake all of the efforts to save ourselves, to have a part in our own salvation. We must forsake all of those efforts or we will not be saved. Forsaking all, I trust Him. 
There's no difference between the man with the criminal record and the religious deacon. In the sight of God, there is none righteous, no, not one. So works must go. They must not be boasted of, counted on, trusted in. No, you are saved by grace through faith, not by good works. Well, what part do works play? What part do good works play? play. Let's go back to that original simple statement that I made. You are saved by God's grace and for good works. We are saved by grace through faith, not by good works, but for good works. Look at verse 10. Verse 10 says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in in them. Let me take you back to Friday night. Friday night, the Mount Vernon Tigers were going to play Dallas Madison in Forney at Citibank Stadium. I had never been there, so I did what you probably did. I put the address into my phone. And the, it came up. They, they used the GPS, GPS system. And voila, there it was. The route already marked out for me. Go to Royce City. Take exit Farm to Market Road 548 and go south. And it'll take you winding down through there. Man, Royce City is growing. Have y'all been there? I mean, there's houses all over the place. But it took me right there. All I had to do was follow the course that was already marked out on my phone. The good way that I should go had been prepared beforehand. All I had to do was follow it. That's the idea in verse 10. God has marked out, he has prepared in advance good works that you are to do. But not just good works. I believe they are God-ordained works because it says God has prepared them in advance. Now, Wrap your mind around that. That they are not just good works. I don't get up today and decide to help an old lady across the street, buy somebody a tank of gas, pay for somebody in line behind me, you know, at the drive through at Dairy Queen. You know, I just don't get up and decide to do that. No, no, no. These things are prepared in advance. God has prepared them in advance. They are not just good works. They are God-ordained works that you and I are to walk in. So God's plan for your day is to walk in those good works that he's already planned. So here's what I do. Here's what I suggest you do. Every morning, I pray, and when I pray in the morning, I make two requests. Lord, lead me to those people who need my ministry today. Lead me to those people. Bring them into my path. Take me into their life that need my ministry today. And then I pray this, Lord, lead me to those people today that I need their ministry in my life. I need those people. Let me encounter people today who have a word for me, who have an encouraging word for me. And so it's two ways. Lord, lead me into those lives of those people whom you have prepared in advance for me to minister to, and Lord, lead me into the lives of those people who you have prepared in advance to minister to me. And then I go, and wow, having prayed that, I seek to be led by the Spirit and I listen for the voice of the Spirit. I listen to that tug at my heart that says, go there. I listen to that yank in my spirit that says, 
talk to her, talk to him, talk to them, because I go out every day knowing God has already prepared good works for me to walk in. He has already arranged them. He is already at work on the other end of the line. God winks. God ordained words for me to walk in. And when you face every day that way, I mean, you just can't wait. I can't, I can't wait to, to get out in, into the world every day because there's no telling what God's going to do today. Because I've prayed and I've asked him, fill me with your spirit and take me where you want me to go. That you already have them ready out there waiting on me every day. Both people that I'm supposed to minister to and people that are supposed to minister to me. And you'll be amazed at what you'll see God do at your work site. And in your classroom, and at your office, and even in an aisle at Brookshire's. Because you were created just for those moments. You were created, and the moments were created by your heavenly Father. Wow! What a way to live every day! Knowing that. I can't wait to get up in the morning. We were created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand in advance. He prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Eight, nine, and ten. Amazing verses. But I told you, when I began this morning that we wanted to end with some marvelous truths, some marvelous diamonds to take home, and I don't want to miss that because, you see, our tendency is just to focus on verses 8, 9, and 10, and so we're going to miss just a couple of diamonds here that we need to gather before we go home today. Here, here, here's the first one. As a Christian, you are a trophy of God's grace. As a Christian... You are a trophy of God's grace. Now, you see, we rushed right over it, but that's found in verse 7. Verse 7 says, so that in the coming ages, that's 2018, so that in the coming ages, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Now, here's the pepper paraphrase of verse 7. God desires to put you on display every day. He desires to say to the world, the people that you come into contact with, He desires to say to them, here is an example of what my grace can do in the life of a person. God is a show-off. He wants to show you off. I mean, he's got that trophy all polished up and spick and span and ready to go. And every morning he sends you out there and he wants to say to the world, look, 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 look at her, look at him, look at her, look at him, look at her. They are trophies of what my grace will do in a life. That's verse 7. Man, because there's people that you come into contact with every day who need to hear your story. There's people who need to see your life. They need to know that there is a God who can turn their scars into stars. They need to know there's a God and that they need to see that their past does not define them. They, they, they need to have a hope that their mess can be turned into a message just like your mess has been turned into a message. And they will discover all of that because your life is a trophy of God's grace. It's an example of what someone, it's an example of what God can do when someone forsakes all and trusts Him. One more. As a Christian... You are a trophy of God's grace, and you are a masterpiece in progress. Whoo! 
sends chills down my spine. That's, that's what verse 10, we skipped over the word, but, 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 but verse 10 begins by, you are his masterpiece. Now, that's the way I memorized it. The, the English Standard Version says workmanship. Let me give you a hint. It is the Greek word poem. It's, it's the Greek word poem. Now, I wasn't real impressed with that when I learned that. Seems, sounds kind of wimpy to me. I'm God's poem. But then I begin to think about what a poem is. Have you ever known someone who writes poetry? Have you ever tried to write poetry? I mean, they spend hours agonizing over the right phraseology and the right structure and the right rhythm and the right meter. It, it's not just something you sit down with a sheet of paper and write uh, just first time. No, you struggle. You, you make sure the syllables are, are accurate and the number of them and, and you want the right words. And so, and, and so it, it takes a lot of hands on to design a poem. That's who I am to God. He's working on me. He, he wants to get me just right. He's, he's working on me. I, 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 I'm his design. I am, I am his creation. I am his workmanship. I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. You're a masterpiece in progress. Our God takes men and women, boys and girls, who are spiritually dead, spiritually dominated, spiritually Doomed. He takes boys and girls, men and women, and then gives them life and transforms them into new creations in Christ Jesus. You are indeed a masterpiece in progress. True story. It's the evening shift one night in a hospital in a particular city here in America. <laughs> and a young intern comes by shaking his head as he sits down at the desk. And he says to his co-workers, there's an old man down the hall. There's an old man down there by the vending machines and he is putting dollar bills into the change machine and every time he gets his quarters, he yells, jackpot, and he dances around. Puts another dollar bill in, quarters come out, jackpot, and he dances around. And they get a good laugh. A few hours later, the shift is on break and they're down by the vending machines and they see a repairman. And they ask, why are you working in the middle of the night? Why are you working so late? And he says, I have to get this change machine fixed. It's been giving out six quarters every time somebody puts in a dollar bill. What am I trying to tell you as we close? The time to act is now. The time to act is now. I'm going to ask you today to give your heart to Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask you today to trust him and him alone to save you. I'm going to ask you today to give your life to him by faith. And if you do so, he will forgive your sins. He will come into your heart. He will give you a new nature, and one day he will take you to heaven with him. How can you say no to that? How can you refuse that? 
I'm telling you today, God brought you here this morning to be saved. He, he will save you today and he will keep you saved forever. What would it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? I'm going to ask you today to give your heart to Jesus Christ. And I want you to come even if nobody else comes. I want you to come. Come to Jesus. I'm going to lead us in a word of prayer. We're going to stand and begin to sing. And you come. And give your life today to the one who will save you by his grace and turn you into a masterpiece in progress. Pray. Heavenly Father, thank you today for your truth. Thank you today for the truth of your word. Father, I pray that it's landed on hearts today that were soft. I pray that it landed on that soil that Jesus described that was fertile and that, that it took root today, Father. I, even believers, Father, that it landed on today, we, we needed to be reminded of the truth of our salvation and, and what you want to do in our lives now every day in regard to good works. But, Father, I pray also that it landed on hearts who have yet to come to you. And so draw them to yourself today, Father. Draw them to faith in Christ, to salvation. May they step out from that row and come down the aisle and give their life to Christ. It's in his mighty, powerful name I pray. Amen. Let's stand. Let us stand. And we're going to begin to sing.